Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Rotary Club of London meeting for today. Um, we are recording this meeting and we'll be posting parts of it on our YouTube channel. Um, we will be pausing the recording partway through uh, for uh, Sergeant at Arms and any time personal information is being discussed. A reminder that all the lines are muted. Uh, you just have to unmute yourself and you'll be able to participate in the meeting. So as I mentioned a couple of weeks ago, I will be doing a few different things um, for our meetings. And instead of a toast today, we are going to be reviewing the four-way test. Um, not everyone is familiar with Rotary's four-way test. Um, if you are a new member, um, you probably have not seen it. Uh, it's not something that is commonly uh, reviewed in our club, but I thought it would be important for us to review it every now and then because it really does reflect who we are as Rotarians. So the four-way test is of the things we think, say, or do, is it the truth? Is it fair to all concerned? Will it build goodwill and better friendships? Will it be beneficial to all concerned? And uh, the four-way test has been in Rotary um, since the 1940s was when it was adopted by Rotary International. And many clubs actually open their meetings by reciting the four-way test. Now, I thought about doing that, but I, I know what our club does when we try to do things together on Zoom. It doesn't work out well. So we'll wait till we actually are meeting again in person and we'll be able to recite, recite the four-way test in person. I would now like to invite Ian Davies to introduce our guest speaker. All right, thank you, President Don. I'm pleased to introduce our guest speaker for today, Helen Stevenson, who is the founder and CEO of Reformulary Group, a healthcare company that built a proprietary evidence-based drug list, the Reformulary, and award-winning drug finder tool that provides Canadians with valuable comparative drug information and saves money for company health benefit plans. The company recently launched Cannabis Standard, a platform for Canadians to discover if medical cannabis might work for them. In 2018, Helen was named by Mars Discovery District as one of eight Canadian female founders who have shown a relentless pursuit of success in science and technology. Helen is the former Assistant Deputy Minister of Health and the Executive Officer of Ontario Public Drug Programs. She has a long and impressive list of achievements as a leader in the healthcare field. Helen holds a Bachelor of Commerce degree from McGill and a Master of Science in Management from Boston University, Brussels. She holds the ICD.D designation granted by the Institute of Corporate Directors. This designation represents a lifelong commitment to excellence in the boardroom. Helen has lived and worked in Canada, Belgium, and Switzerland. We welcome Helen, and we look forward to your presentation today. Thank you very much. So a pleasure to be here today. Um, thank you so much for, for inviting me to speak. So I'm just gonna give you, um, thank you for the introduction as well, Ian. I won't go through all of this, um, you know, just to highlight, Sort of the first there, I was Assistant Deputy Minister of Health and managed the big, it's called Ontario Public Drug Programs, but some of you, not all of you have turned 65, but some of you may have. And so that includes the Ontario Drug Benefit Program. So that was part of my mandate. I was brought into the government from the private sector to do some really big reforms of the prescription drug system and did those reforms and eventually then was appointed to that role and after five years, I left and, and founded this company and really on the premise that I thought there was an opportunity for private plans, so em employer health benefit plans to really um, reform what they were doing. It was historically sort of a big blank check and there was a real need for sustainable, long-term sustainability. And so that's what we do at Reformulary Group. So we are, um, we are specialized in prescription drugs. Certainly, we recently, a couple of years ago, launched what we call a formulary, which again, which is a big list in the medical cannabis area. Um, we're privately owned. 
We are a preferred venture of Mars, which is a discovery district, so an innovation hub in Canada. And we rely on um, medical experts, so two committees of medical experts to advise us. One of them, our reformulary expert committee, is a real specialist in prescription drugs um, that comprises doctors and pharmacists. And we're very um, focused. We govern our committees with a very high level of government, governance. So just some disclosures to start with. Um, we are completely agnostic in the medical cannabis space. Um, also, vis-a-vis -vis pharmaceutical companies, we have no investment, no financial interest, et cetera. We don't produce, distribute, sell, or make money from anyone in the cannabis space. And then probably most importantly, I want to say to you that the cannabis space is very complex, and I do not have all the answers. I have lots of answers, but there are certainly some things either I don't understand myself and or I'm just not familiar with. So just to let you know that. So I'm gonna give you, sort of walk you through a little bit of a sort of cannabis 101 and then focus specifically on that, on that medical space. Um, so cannabis is a plant. It's also a medicine. Um, it's a recreational substance and it is also a multi-billion dollar industry in Canada. In terms of the plant, it's actually a type of flowering plant that is indigenous to Central Asia. Um, it's actually been cultivated and used by mankind for about 6,000 years, although in the last five years, I think it's fair to say it's gained really cons considerably more attention and also probably more use. Um, and it does, the cannabinoids, which is the part of the plant, certainly that is used um, for, can for marijuana, but also cannabis, medical cannabis, it really exists in the highest concentrations in the flowering parts of the female cannabis plants. In terms of the cannabinoids themselves, so they're a class of chemical compounds. They do actually naturally exist in the human body, and they also exist in the cannabis plants. The ones that you've probably heard of the most are CBD, which is cannabinoid, and THC. And so CBD is non-psychoactive, meaning it doesn't have an impact sort of on your, on the psychoactivity in your brain. It typically does not cause impairment. And generally with respect to workplace testing, it is not specifically targeted. On the other hand, THC is psychoactive. It can cause impairment. And often in, again, the workplace drug testing, this would be a targeted cannabinoid that they're testing. Here in Canada, so we have um, medical cannabis was legalized back in 2001. It's regulated by Health Canada, which is the regulatory body. Health Canada also regulates things like prescription drugs, medical devices, etc. It can be purchased online from a licensed producer. So a licensed producer is essentially, I'll say if, if any of you take prescription drugs, it's essentially equivalent to a pharmaceutical company. So that is the, the producer that is, has been licensed by Health Canada to produce cannabis. Um, a patient has to have a medical authorization and that medical authorization, again, there are certain information that's required by Health Canada to be provided and then a physician or a healthcare practitioner that has prescribing rights would sign that. And it's shipped directly to a patient's home. That's something very unique as it relates to sort of a medical product because, you know, with prescription drugs, for instance, you'd go to the pharmacy, you take your prescription there, your pharmacist keys it in and looks if it's covered, if it's covered by your benefit plan, by ODB, et cetera. And then essentially you get the prescription directly from the pharmacist. The pharmacist coaches you, for instance, on, on how to take that medication, et cetera. With medical cannabis, it's quite different. As I said, you would take your form. It's a, it's a form uh, called a medical document from Health Canada. You would get it signed by your physician and you actually would send it to the licensed producer. Um, you'd probably want to, you know, call the licensed producer and they provide you some information on their products and then it gets shipped to your home. So quite a bit different. Legal recreational cannabis. So this was legalized on October 7th, 17th, 2018 to, I would say to much fanfare. Um, it, it is now regulated by Health Canada. It's available to anyone who is of age. So different provinces do have a different majority of ages, for instance. And then the other part that is quite complex is that every province has its own retail 
um, retail model, storefront sales, online ordering, et cetera. Here in Ontario, we have something called the Ontario Cannabis Stores, um, and that is, that is essentially regulated by the provincial government. But we also have a lot of, actually, there's been an increasing number of cannabis stores that have opened up. And in fact, today, the Globe and Mail had an interesting article about um, some of, of people opening up cannabis stores, and we now actually have too many. So just to, um, that was interesting today in the Globe. So as it relates to the medical cannabis market, back in uh, 2019, there are about 369,000 registered medical cannabis patients. You'll see there at the bottom of the slide, in March of 2021, there were 292,399. So actually quite a substantial increase in about a year and a half. And part of that re the reason, which I'll, I'll give you a little bit more context to in the, in the coming slides, is the, the, the shift from the medical market, because there's so much more availability in the recreational market, people that have typically taken it for medical use are actually going to the recreational market. Now that in itself has its own issues, but just to say that we saw this big increase, right? And remember medical cannabis has been legal since 2001. So big increase to September, 2019, it had just been legalized about a year or not quite a year prior. And then all of a sudden, as we started to see a large increase in the number of cannabis stores, so recreational cannabis stores, we've now seen this big decrease in medical cannabis, registered medical cannabis patients. The legalization of recreational cannabis, as you may remember, October 17th, 2018, um, lots of complaints way back then about supply issues. People there, there is, I will say there is still a thriving black market for, can for recreational cannabis or marijuana. Um, we've had lots of, you know, it says cannabis inventories have exceeded sales, so there's lots of, of cannabis on the market. And then it, about a year after it was orig originally legalized, we had new classes of cannabis then that were permitted. So we had edibles, we had cannabis extracts, for instance, that could be put in all sorts of different, you know, in drinks, etc., and cannabis topicals. And sales of those then were permitted back in 2019. Um, there was, so as has been tracked, there was actually, I find this quite an interesting survey. So this was a survey that the federal government did with respect to cannabis. So they had about 12,000 respondents, of which close to 4,000 were cannabis users. It was over a three-month period from April to June 2019. And I think what's, um, well, anyway, I'll walk you through them and then I'll sort of give you my commentary. So it, it was a very lengthy survey. So I really just highlighted what I think are, are some of the interesting, um, the interesting results. So the average age of someone initiating cannabis use is 19 years of age. 67% of the people that responded, so of the almost 4,000 users, were stoned or high for between one and four hours on a typical day. 26% of the people drove within two hours of smoking or vaping cannabis. And again, these people are not, um, most of these people are recreational users. They are not medical cannabis users. So why is that important? Because medical cannabis users tend to use either exclusively CBD, right? Remember CBD is non-psychoactive, so there's not really impairment. Um, and or they use CBD with a tiny bit of THC. Recreational users use almost exclusively THC. So people are driving within two hours of smoking or vaping cannabis or marijuana, essentially, um, with right, typically high contents of THC. So 80% of those people drove because they didn't feel impaired. 20% thought they could drive carefully. 19% thought they could drive because they didn't have to drive very far. So it had nothing to do with their condition. It had to do with the fact that they were probably just thinking they were just going around the corner. And 7% didn't think they would get caught. So that said, 85% of the people think that cannabis use actually does affect driving. And yet people are right driving even though they don't feel impaired. Of the medical users, so again, that was the recreational users, 
Of the medical users, 73% of the people that reported using cannabis for medical purposes did not get a medical document for a healthcare practitioner, meaning 73% of them went to the recreational market. 27% of them there, therefore did actually obtain cannabis um, from a, using a medical document signed by a healthcare practitioner. And 43% of these people indicated that cannabis use does impair one's ability to drive. So again, first set was around recreational users. Second set was around medical cannabis, or the medical users, for instance. You know, one of the challenges with the, with I would say the cannabis space in general is that, you know, unlike a prescription medication, if anyone is, has heard of the drug Lipitor, for instance. So Lipitor is the generic version of that drug is atorvastatin. So that's the active ingredient. If you get a 10 milligram tablet of Lipitor, you know that there's 10 milligrams of atorvastatin in that tablet. Um, absolutely no questions asked. You are guaranteed of that. The challenge around cannabis, be it medical or recreational, with medical, we know a lot more of the composition. With recreational, we know much less. The challenge here is that because it's from a plant, there is no certainty and there's no guarantee that there's an exact amount of, of the different cannabinoids within that product. And so that's one of the challenges we have in this space is that we simply don't have a guarantee that it's, for instance, 98% CBD, for instance. And so um, it is, as I mentioned, one of, the, one of the concerns in this area. So just a couple of slides in terms of, as we would say in the global market, the green rush. So globally right now, over 40 countries have legalized medical cannabis in some form or another. Um, Canada and Uruguay, and so this is probably, Canada and Uruguay are the only one that have medical and recreational use. Um, the spending back in 2018 was about 12.3 billion globally, and it's projected to be 57 billion in the next few years. So huge, huge increase in spend on cannabis, both medical and recreational. In the US, and I, I include this because no doubt some of you travel to the US, um, the US is complex from the perspective of medical cannabis is legal in some states. Um, as it relates to hemp, in 2018, the US Farm Bill is what it's called, changed the definition of marijuana to exclude cannabis and, and renamed that as hemp. Recreational cannabis is only legal for use under state law in certain states. And so there's a handful of states where it's still illegal, where all THC, CBD, marijuana, and hemp products remain illegal. But because of that definition from marijuana to exclude cannabis equals hemp, there is a lot more, um, there's a lot more cannabis that's legal now in different states. What is not legal is crossing federal borders with any form of it. Because again, federally, it is not legal. So you've got legal in different states, for instance, and you can cross over from some states to another, but not legal coming in and out of the US. So I'm just gonna focus now a little bit on the medical use of cannabis. So there's lots of patients that report that they use medical cannabis for insomnia. So trouble sleeping, for instance, arthritis, different types of pain, depression and anxiety, glaucoma, for instance, addictions, Parkinson's disease, Crohn's and colitis, et cetera. But what's important is that there's really no or limited evidence to support use in many of these conditions. And so people are really using cannabis, in medical cannabis, to treat certain conditions where there's no evidence to support use. Opinions related to the use of medical cannabis are on a huge spectrum. So for instance, you have some organizations you'll see there to the left, like the Canadian Mental Health Association, the Canadian Pediatric Society, where it is just simply a hard no. Do not use medical cannabis. They're not supportive of it. You have that in between, maybe, possibly, but not yet. And then you do have a large organization or number of organizations, which is a yes. So they support use of medical cannabis. Um, some of the challenges, so just to, I've alluded to this to some extent, most patients do not understand the products. 
So we really believe, and this is something, a need that we filled, that there was a need for an independent, reliable advice related to medical cannabis products. There is a shortage of physicians that are either knowledgeable and or willing to prescribe medical cannabis. And so that makes it difficult for patients to access cannabis. And as a result, many people go to clinics, for instance. There's also a lack or little due diligence read who's actually authorizing dosing, for instance. So until earlier this week, we really had no um, sort of consensus on dosing of medical cannabis, for instance. And so by dosing, what I mean is, should you take 10 milligrams twice a day? Should you take it in the morning, at night, et cetera? And there were product shortages and really an absence of any kind of tool whereby you could compare product types from multiple licensed producers. So just to give you a quick example there, in one state in the US, there are 17 different versions of, of a cannabis product called Pink Kush. And not one of those products is the same. So every single Pink Kush has a pretty different composition of what's inside. So you could have one product that has, again, let's call it 98% composition CBD and another version of Pink Kush that has 98% THC. And it's because we really, there's no real good accountability with respect to what actually is in each individual strain, not to mention the fact that you can call the product whatever you want. You know, if I go back to my example of Lipitor, you can only call it Lipitor or Atorvastatin if it actually has Atorvastatin in it. So we have an absolute degree of certainty that if we're taking Lipitor, that we're taking Atorvastatin. In the cannabis market, that's not at all the way it is. Prescribing is messy. So there's no thorough review that had been done in Canada. Um, healthcare practitioners are the ones that authorize use. But what happens is, is when a patient gets an authorization to use medical cannabis, they call the licensed producer and they essentially ask the licensed producer for their advice. And what you're getting at, and, and I say it very respectfully, but you're going to get someone, let's say someone named Sharon answers the phone and Sharon may say to you, I've tried medical cannabis because I have pain related to arthritis and this is the product I use. And that's the extent of the, of the recommendation. There's not necessarily any evidence behind it. It's one person's experience and they tried that product and that's the information they're providing you. And so that's right, obviously a concern as well because we can't rely on just one person's you know, personal experience. The other with prescribing is licensed producers are restricted from advertising and differentiating their brands. That actually might be a good thing. Um, there's really only about 20% of the physicians that have actually asked, they've actually used what's called the access to cannabis for medical purposes regulations or the ACMPR. So in other words, 80% of physicians have not provided any kind of authorization for cannabis. And then another reason prescribing is messy is because cannabis cl clinics have really evolved to provide support for patients where many other doctors have just avoided medical cannabis altogether. And the cannabis clinics, as I'll get into, are somewhat conflicted. So cannabis clinics are often owned by licensed producers. So that's like a pharmaceutical company own, owning the pharmacy, which is for, forbidden in Canada. Pharmacies then are paying specialists to teach doctors about prescribing. So we do now have some pharmacies that are starting to, um, that are able to um, dispense medical or cannabis. And so if they're paying specialists to teach doctors, right, that there's a conflict in there. And then on the other side, they're also incentives. So they get referral fees, for instance, educational grants, commissions. And this is a quote, again, from the National Post back in early 2019, where it says, right, the LPs are paying millions of dollars to clinics in exchange for patients who register for their prescriptions. So this is another, you'll see there the numbers, they usually pay the clinic 15 to 20% of the cost of each dose. So if the clinic is, what if, what if your cannabis product, if we didn't, th those sort of kickbacks weren't taking place, the cost of your cannabis product would be a lot less expensive too. And then, as I mentioned earlier, the black market is definitely active and thriving in Canada. Cost varies widely. 
So way back several years ago, on average, it was between three and $8,000 per year. The costs have actually dramatically decreased over the last few years, and it's more like $600 to $3,600 per year. Um, you'll see then most patients spend between $1,000 and $4,000. And again, there is that a dramatic range in different costs, and that complicates decisions as well. Through employers, and this may not be um, you know, that relevant to you, but medical cannabis, um, it is dispensed through licensed producers. It's actually only, it's sometimes um, insurance will cover, but only for medical cannabis, insured plan, or, or sorry, employer benefit plans will not cover recreational cannabis. Um, you'll see there the Veterans Affairs Canada, for instance, and you may have read about that in the paper. They had really struggled with a, a, a skyrocketing cost for medical cannabis. They now actually have put a maximum on it and a maximum reimbursement rate. And then the other um, sort of point of note is, if I can go back to the example of Lipitor, so every single strength of every single and form of every single drug has what's called a, a DIN or a drug identification number. And so that um, medical cannabis does not have a DIN. Part of the reason it doesn't have a DIN is because we, we can't narrow down, you know, what is the exact active ingredient and how much of that active ingredient is, is in there. So 10 milligrams of atorvastat, we don't know that with medical cannabis. So it doesn't have a DIN. So some of the employer concerns about medical cannabis you know, is just around how the use will, will impact workplace. The whole issue around impairment is very complex. How we define impairment, how we handle, deal with that. Um, there's been different, you know, under human rights legislation, there's these accommodations. And so employers are required to accommodate an employee with medical authorization to use cannabis. And it's, it's what's characterized as to the point of undue hardship. And so here you'll see an example, for instance, an airline pilot who insisted on using high THC. Remember, THC is psychoactive, so it's impaired, right? It creates impairment. Um, in that particular case, in front of the Human Rights Tribunal, they deemed that it would be a hardship for the airline. So the airline couldn't, sort of, I'll use the word, tolerate that if a pilot actually was taking right high THC. But these are very complex areas. There have been a number of cases of late that have gone either through, there was one in Nova Scotia that went to the Supreme Court there, and again, through some of the human rights tribunals. So I will just give you, I've got about two or three slides around um, cannabis standard, which is what we did. So we, um, as I mentioned at the very beginning, we have a prescription drug formulary. So we have groups of doctors and pharmacists that review the evidence, both the clinical evidence, but also the cost effectiveness evidence related to prescription drugs. So we took that same formula and we essentially did it related to medical cannabis. So we started, we put together a committee of five doctors, all of whom who have a lot of experience authorizing cannabis. We reviewed about 200 clinical publications. So that's a paper that would have been published in a medical journal that describes you know, a study, for instance, or a real world evidence related to the use. We use a benchmark called good quality evidence. So in the, in the whole world of reviewing evidence for drugs or cannabis, et cetera, there's a scale in terms of none, very limited, et cetera. So we choose what's considered to be good quality. Um, and based on that, as I mentioned, our, so our, there to the left, our initial focus was actually on conditions those conditions, um, what we did is we evaluated in a great level of detail the trials, so the big randomized control trials. So that's when they bring, they recruit lots of different patients and those patients are put on medications. In this case, they, were, they use medical cannabis and they really monitor the impact of that. So that was part of our review. Research is constantly evolving in this space. And so um, we reviewed about another 150 publications in all sorts of different areas, you know, in um, diabetes, you know, kidney disease, concussions, for instance, looking at drug interactions, et cetera. And so that's part of the research that we did. And we put it into what we call an ecosystem of around medical cannabis of, of real um, good quality advice related to the use of medical cannabis. 
So there's originally there is a, a place to be able to come in and answer certain questions. And based on those questions, we're able to provide information related to whether there's good quality evidence to support using it. Um, and based on that, the other side of it is on the other end, we also encourage patients to track their journey. So to track um, their quality of life. This is a quality of life tool that we deployed that is used. It is not specific to medical cannabis. So it could be used by people tracking, for instance, using prescription drugs or just, or through COVID, right? There was a lot of, there've been a lot of different impacts on people throughout COVID as well. So that's part of our, of our platform. And that was really it. I, I, I'd I be happy to take any questions, but I just thought I'd give you that overview, for instance, of, of the cannabis space, both a little bit about the rec and then some more about the medical space. Wonderful. We will now open for questions. Just a reminder, you'll need to unmute your line. And if I see a lot of people, I will ask you to raise your hand to ask a question. Uh, I can see. Is that Jan? Yes. Hi. Uh, nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. I really enjoyed your presentation. I did have a question. When you were talking about um, the problems the airlines are having with pilots being allowed to have marijuana, which is what I understood, how can they do that if you're not allowed to have marijuana to drive a car? Oh, sorry. So pilots are not permitted to have mar smoke marijuana. So my example, so I was using sort of the literal legal language, which is, um, in this particular case that had come up around a pilot using t marijuana, THC, the, the courts actually favored the airline, saying that it would be a hardship to the airline if a pilot were permitted to use uh, marijuana. So I was just using sort of the legal, I guess the legal language of it, but no, they do not permit it. It's a good question. Thanks for, thanks for asking me to clarify it. So I actually have a couple of questions. Um, the first one is CBD. Uh, what What is it? It seems to have kind of burst into the market in the last couple of years um, and it's just out there and everywhere. Can you explain that a little bit more? Yeah, so CBD is, um, right, is the cannabinoid. It is, again, as I mentioned at one point, it's non-psychoactive. It is what's used in medical cannabis, for instance, oils, for instance, or sometimes there's medical cannabis where people may vape it, for instance, but vaping is really discouraged. Oils is a really good way to take cannabis. That said, CBD now has started to present itself in creams, in all sorts of other different forms. And certainly there's, I will say there's really no evidence yet to, to support using it in creams. It seems to be more of an over-the-counter thing. Um, and so what's really important is using it where we know there's, right, like for instance, CBD, what we would call CBD dominant products, where there's a, right, more, much more of CBD and only trace amounts of THC. The cannabis standard, is that available to the general public or is that only available through physicians or is it a subscription sort of service or? Um, it is available to the general public. There is no fee to it. Um, we opened it up. We originally had one and then we opened it up because we wanted to use, just uh, allow as many people as possible who want to use it. So if you go to cannabisstandard.com, you could enter your, enter your information, for instance, your medical conditions, symptoms, and go through the process and get, get the medical document. And the same with the track your journey, right? Which we think is really important is we think we as Canadians should help contribute to the, you know, the larger base of evidence around medical cannabis use. So by tracking your own, how, you know, how your use of cannabis or drugs, by the way, this prescription drugs, this isn't specific to cannabis. This is an important, you know, contribution to the base of evidence. I have a question. Um, is there any, uh, um, let's see, information that you have available on your uh, website that can shed some light on use of CBDs as a sleep aid? Yeah, so what's, what's important to know about um, cannabis is that cannabis treats symptoms of medical conditions. So it doesn't actually ever treat a condition, you know, nor can it cure cancer, et cetera. So I know that sometimes in the news, we see that we see sort of comments around that. So it's treating um, 
is treating a symptom. So a symptom, insomnia, having trouble, you know, falling asleep or staying asleep is the symptom of another medical condition. So that is where there is good quality evidence to support using it. And so that's really what's important. And if you went on cannabis standard, you'd, you'd be asked your medical condition first, and then you'd be asked specific symptoms. And that's where, right, when we narrow in on, on is it sleep, is it pain, for instance, that's what's important. So the answer is yes, although it's the evidence is specific to, to sleep related to a specific condition. Go ahead, Rick. Uh, is there any um, evidence uh, that uh, CBD is effective uh, in treating symptoms for those that suffer from fibromyalgia? Yes. Um, and it's not the fibromyalgia, it's, it's sort of pain related to fibromyalgia. Yes, there is good quality evidence. And, and, and how would someone uh, uh, go about in investigating that? Uh, go on this, the website you were talking about and... Uh... I mean, I would, I mean, yeah, I would say yes. And remember, we don't, we don't, we don't make any money from, from people going to it. So just to make that, you know, remind you of that disclosure. Yes, because what we would have done then is we would have reviewed many, many articles about fibromyalgia and the use of CBD. And so that's the benefit is you'd have access right by sort of, near, you'd go in and you'd say, right, you have fibromyalgia and let's say you have pain. And you'll have to actually specify, we'll ask you specifically what kind of pain, is it burning, tingling, or is it sharp throbbing, et cetera. And that then what we, in the background, what it's doing is essentially um, looking up right in our big database, the evidence for that. And it will make you a recommendation to go have a conversation with your doctor. Okay. So we and would encourage people who are interested in cannabis to go to your own healthcare practitioner um, just for continuity of care, because it's, you don't want to really, uh, as Canadians, we don't want to go here for that and hear that because then you're not coordinating the different medications you're taking. And, and you really, it's important that your physician has sort of the whole, you know, overview of, <clears throat> of, 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 of your medical conditions. Of course. And in our, in our chat line, if you wouldn't mind, uh, uh, putting your, uh, website to oh, add sure. to that, again, that would be helpful. Thank you. So, so related to that question, um, you mentioned earlier that 80% of physicians aren't prescribing medical marijuana. Yes, that is it. So that is the number of physicians that are not authorized, right? That have not. So I'm trying to figure out how do you, how does, how does, so if you have one of those 80% of physicians, um, how do you refer them to an appropriate resource? Um, it is, and that is an excellent question, and that is part of the problem, right? The sort of messiness of prescribing. Um, <clears throat> I guess it would be if your physician doesn't, I mean, you can certainly email me and I can refer you to one of the physicians that we work with. And again, we don't get paid for any of that. Um, but it is, it is one of the challenges for sure. That said, your own physician might be able to refer you on to a physician that does authorize cannabis. It'd be worth, it would be worth asking. Are there any more questions? Yeah, I, I was wondering about the standardization. So if you wear prescribed, how do you know what sort of dosage that you're getting if there is no standardization? Is it still experimental mm -hmm. at that point? You, you take what you need or how do you determine? That yeah, that, that's a great question. So we, we do in, in, if you go onto our platform, you'll see, we do provide guidance in terms of dosing, but essentially now I know that, that I mean, this is something that's evolving. I know just from in the last month, for instance, our own physicians have told us that typically they, they start people on a pretty high dose of CBD. So CBD, if you took a high dose of THC, it would be, it would be a problem but not necessarily of CBD. So they're starting people on higher doses of sort of, you know, pure CBD. And then if people are not responding, they're adding THC. But you can definitely go to, go to our cannabisstandard.com, go in and sort of, and you can see when you produce the medical document, you can, it'll give, it'll give dosing guidelines to be able to share with your physician. How knowledgeable are pharmacists when it comes to cannabis? Because quite frequently, 
uh, we're prescribed, but we talk to the pharmacist after the prescription yeah. because they sometimes have a deeper knowledge of the drug and its interactions with other drugs. And when we're taking a handful of drugs already, adding another, are the pharmacists um, ahead of the physicians in that knowledge base? So, so no, I mean, it's, it's interesting, an interesting question. You're absolutely right. Pharmacists are the experts related to prescription drugs. They, they know far more than physicians and certainly around interactions. In the cannabis space, that wouldn't be true. So way back, right, when the medical cannabis framework was being developed, pharmacists were asked if they wanted to play a role in it and they declined. And so as a result, that's how this system evolved in terms of the actual licensed producers themselves being involved in <clears throat> providing guidance around what product you take. But as I mentioned, the problem there is it's really just one person, right? Who's conflicted, you know, giving you that information. Pharmacists are starting to catch up now, but I would say a physician who is, is, has, is used to authorizing medical cannabis would still likely know more than a pharmacist at this point, but pharmacists are starting to catch up. And in terms of standardization, is it because it can't be done or because it isn't being done? Well, I would say, so it's definitely not being done um, in terms of the can't be done. And we actually did make a big first attempt at standardizing in, if you went to our platform, you'll see there's an index. And that was really a way to provide people with the composition of what's in that cannabis product. And we get all that information from the licensed producer directly. That said, <clears throat> right now, that's about as best as one could possibly get. The problem is, is that <clears throat> because it's a plant, when if they were to say there's 10 milligrams of this, there's really no guarantee because it's from a plant. And so this, again, is sort of always going to be the main, you know, one of the big differences between drugs where they're chemical ingredients, right? They're very precise with respect to the composition and cannabis where it's more of a plant. And so until we actually get to more synthetic, meaning chemical derived cannabis, we're, we're gonna, we have to sort of manage using, it's about this range of CBD and about this range of THC, et cetera. Wonderful. Thank you very much. A very um, informative presentation. I didn't expect it to be quite this informative um, and have so many questions, but thank you very much pleasure for sharing your expertise with us pleasure uh, thank you very much in recognition of your presentation to our club today a contribution has been made to the polio plus campaign of the rotary foundation uh, to immunize 50 infants against polio so thank you very much because of you rotary is one step closer to a polio free world thank you so I don't think Heather Broadhead is at our meeting today, but uh, so I guess I will have to do this reporting on her behalf. Um, last week, last Monday afternoon after our Rotary meeting, um, Heather and Keith and Jim Swan and myself uh, were able to deliver our final checks to the uh, Nightingale place. This was the final $25,000. Uh, which was the last installment of the $75,000 commitment our club made to Nightingale Place. We were able to have a very quick tour of just a little bit of Nightingale Place, uh, still challenging because of COVID, uh, but we were able to see the sign inside the office and get a quick look at everything and talk to them about community housing here in the City of London and the challenges and other opportunities in the future. So it was a, a great visit with uh, Sister Joan and Dale uh, from Nightingale Place. Keith or Jim, is there anything that you wanted to add? If not, the other um, where I'm wearing my Heather hat is the golf right, reminder regarding the golf tournament coming up on September the 11th. We are still looking for sponsors. We are still looking for players um, and just reach out to Heather for any of that. And then one last announcement, and I'll about to possibly leave this to the end. Are there any other announcements for the club? Uh, yes, Don. Uh, just uh, want to uh, advise the club that uh, bingos are starting back, and our Rotary Club has two bingos scheduled. One is going to be on August the 8th, which is a Sunday, uh, and the other one will be in September. Um, and uh, 
I can't remember the date right now, but uh, I'm, I'm waiting to hear back uh, from Ian Wright as to what the association uh, new product specific protocols will be. I can tell you that we will only need three Rotarians to work these bingos. They will only be the evening bingos, the standard time from uh, six, basically six o'clock until uh, 10 o'clock in the evening. So that's good news. We're gonna start generating some bingo revenue again. Wonderful, thank you. Any other announcements? Uh, yes, <laughs> East Coast Kitchen Party. <laughs> <laughs> there, there's, there's, there is the possibility <clears throat> that we might be able to have an in-person or a hybrid type of uh, meeting uh, and uh, it's going to be explored further but uh, David Elliott has advised that uh, he does have a date uh, for a fall East Coast kitchen party that could be held in person and that is right now the first date they're talking about is October the 8th so I'll, I'll let you finish uh, on that. Okay, so I promised that I would run a quick poll of the club. So you should see on your screen a quick poll regarding the East Coast Kitchen Party. And we're just looking for feedback from club members as to one, do you think you would attend an East Coast Kitchen Party in early October based on the current COVID-19 status and the kind of what the trajectory looks like we, we never know exactly what's gonna happen, but based on current status and, and the current trajectory, do you think you would attend? And then the second question is, do you think you would be able to sell tickets to an East Coast Kitchen Party um, if it was to happen in October? So I'll give everybody just a little bit more time to vote because not everybody has voted yet. So we're just kind of looking for feedback. I'm not tracking names here, this is all anonymous. So uh, we're just kind of looking for your feedback as do, do you think you would be comfortable attending and do you think you would be able to sell tickets to friends, family, coworkers? You just click on it, Don? You just click on it, yes. So Don, can I uh, just uh, add on that uh, to that? It, it's a, an area of four projects so it involves all the clubs in London. So what David and Jim Swan have asked really is if, if the clubs are interested in, in holding it as rick said they have the date held so it's if the clubs are interested then it'll go ahead if not it'll wait on there is a one book for next may the friday before mother's day which uh, is a traditional day that we've had the previous ones so right now it's just to garner interest and if, if people say yes the london east club has said they are interested that's the only one i know of right now So if everybody has answered the question, uh, these look like the results. I will send these to you, Howard and Rick. Thanks, Don. So that you have them. And we'll be discussing it at the board meeting. On Wednesday, yes. Yeah. Before we close our meeting, a few reminders. Cocktail hour will be tomorrow night at 5 p.m. Um, Coffee Clatch will be Thursday at 10.30 a.m. Is that Atlantic or Eastern Time, Howard? Uh, that would be uh, Eastern Time, 10.30. Okay. Uh, the Satellite Club will be meeting tomorrow night at 6.30 p.m. We have a board meeting this week, Wednesday at 5 p.m. Our speaker next week will be Carol Stevenson. And we also will be having a little bit about me chat next week. It will be Sherrod Rye who will be giving that conversation. Um, we will now let everyone go. And remember this year's motto, serve to change lives. Have a very good week.